this, this legendary guitar maker in Madrid, Spain. And uh, like all companies, it goes through several stages. But one of the first major uh, things to happen to the company uh, had to be the appearance of Andres Segovia, the famous classical guitarist who practically owned the 20th century, uh, to appear at the door one day of the Ramirez shops and uh, from then on play Ramirez guitars in his careers. And it brought worldwide fame to both entities, Segovia and the Ramirez shop. And uh, I want to transport you to what it was like um, as a young man, Segovia was so completely absorbed and committed to his path uh, that he adopted all the trappings of the thing that he uh, believed he was going to become. Uh, so uh, he was going to be the greatest monster of the guitar ever, and as he began to look around, he saw that the instrument, as he says, was at a virtual standstill uh, in the country. No one was writing for it. The only people who played it were flamenco players on the street corners. And uh, so he had this great lifelong work ahead of him to resurrect the instrument. So when he went to the Ramirez store in uh, 1911, uh, here is, you have to imagine, uh, this young man, 18 years old, he's trying to make an impression upon this shop. Segovia writes in his autobiography, I was a tall and skinny young man with long black hair flowing under a wide brimmed hat, tortoise shell glasses, a wide and full cravat like the ones some provincial photographers wore in order to give themselves artistic airs, a black velvet jacket fastened up to my neck with silver buttons, a long gray double-breasted overcoat, striped pants, patent leather shoes, and in my hand, a sturdy cane to further enhance my image. I was barely 18 years old. Um, <laughs> that's one way to make an impression, I guess. I don't, I, it seems it'd have, to, it'd have to be October to be wearing all those clothes. Um, but uh, Jose Ramirez met him and saw right through it and said, well, sure, kid, you know, you want to you try a guitar. Come back here and try a guitar. And uh, so Segovia went back in the shop, tried a guitar. and. Uh, there's another long story about how captivated and, and enthralled he was. Needless to say, Segovia fell deeply in love with the instrument, and he was fine. He finally now had a tool with which he could communicate the magic of the guitar to audiences. In fact, the instrument was made by Santos Hernandez, who was at the time an apprentice guitar maker in the Ramirez shop and uh, was accustomed to building what we call a long scale uh, instrument. Um, I know some of you are taking notes. <clears throat> that was a joke. Uh, so the scale is, is, is trying to define the length of a string that's vibrating, not the whole string. The string scale is from this white bar to this white bar, and it's a specific measurement. The common measurement, uh, Ramirez measurements are uh, 65 centimeters. Uh, Santos Hernandez made all of his 655. That certainly appealed to Segovia because he had very large hands, and also that greater distance allowed more along the scale of the guitar to accurately play counterpoint and polyphony and all of those things. 
So let's see if it works. Um, Scobia fell in love with, I um, wonder if I should explain this, I'll do that later. Segovia fell in love with the works of a, a Spanish compatriot named Francisco Tauriga. Tauriga produced a lot of transcriptions of works by other composers to attract an audience for the guitar. He also had uh, many short uh, pieces that were original to him, uh, so, sometimes called character pieces. And his, one, his most famous brief uh, piece is called Lagrima. In Spanish it means tear. like, well, it's not like the flute because it plays more than one note at a time, right? Um, what other instruments play lots of notes all at the same time? An orchestra would be one. Xylophone or marimba, you can play lots of different notes at the same time. Piano, of course, uh, and then the guitar. But what do all the other instruments, uh, the string family of instruments for an orchestra, cello, viola, violin, double bass, they can play what are called double and triple stops, but it gets a little clunky sometimes if you're not a full-on and furious virtuoso. <laughs> um, what else? Harp, harp can play a bunch of notes. Cello, 
Well, yeah, but the, but you're you're really going to be limited to probably just three notes to play at once, and to get the fourth, which you can do, you're going to have to arc the bow around. You know, that sounds a little clunky sometimes. Um, so that leads to the search of well, what is it? What does it do? What is it? What's it like? And what are its characteristics? And it comes down to this, and you're going to need to break out your pocket dictionaries here. It's harmonic, homophonic, polyphonic, contrapuntal, rhythmic, and percussive. There's a whole range of things. Depending on who you're hanging out with, this is called palm mute or pizzicato. So the literature then that we play with the guitar is filled with some of these effects that gives, breathes new life into uh, and not only the inventory, but the, the listening experience. But what about the playing? How do you, how do you learn how to, to play all of that? And aren't there several directions? There's, if, if you think of sound, sort of up and down. It's all these notes happening all at once and it's vertical. This is happening horizontally. So if we take that first piece, you have both going on. We have this accompaniment here that is the vertical and then you have the melody. about exactly these kind of things every time you sit down to play. It's the best gin money can buy. That's not true. So it's valuable to have a teacher to figure things out. Also, we're, if you think about flamenco music in Spain, now that at one time only has two notes sounding, never more. Only two notes. The rest of it is all single notes. It's called Music Box uh, by David Leonard.
good writing that you don't have a lot of. But that's what it sounds like. You've got a lot of that vertical harmony. Um, we're going to run out of gas here. So uh, I should ask if anyone has any questions uh, about what we've been talking about. Or are you also enthralled by the music that these are tremendous guitars in every sense. Um, in ninety nineteen ninety three, I went uh, to Spain to play and. Um, I had an introduction to the Ramirez shop through Christopher Parkening, and when I got to Madrid, I was allowed to tour the factory where they made the lesser uh, uh, product lines, and then I went down to the, the famous store down on the main square in, in Madrid, well, one of the squares in, in Madrid where the original shop was, and uh, I was allowed into their inner sanctum, uh, taken upstairs. You, you go up a, an, an ancient wooden staircase, and the wall that's on the left here is solid with photographs uh, like you get from publicists. Yeah, and it's all Jose, thank you. Well, it's every famous guitar player ever on earth. All, they're all right there in, in that shop. I was taken upstairs, which is where the museum um, and the main storage area is. The, the, the museum is a, is a glass enclosed uh, case that's probably uh, six uh, by seven. And it has uh, famous instruments of the Ramirez shop and famous instruments of Spanish luthiers. For example, they have an original uh, 18, 60 Torres uh, guitar in there, and uh, I wasn't able to play that. <laughs> um, but I did uh, play 32 instruments uh, during that session. Um, I was planning to buy one, so they had a whole uh, raft of instruments laid out, and they just left me alone up there for about two and a half hours. and. Uh, a very good thing to do, this is a tip for those of you that might be shopping, the, um, the strings on a classical guitar are these wound bases, these three bases here that are closest to your chin. They have a steel wrapping around those. Just about any guitar can make a good bass sound. If you don't like the sound it makes, you can change the brand of string and get a better sound. The harder thing to get is up here, what's called the trebles. These three strings that are the clear nylon and are closest to the floor. The thing you want to check for is, is to make sure the instrument will play clear, loud, and beautiful notes in tune all the way up. And that's all I did, was take all those guitars out and play only the troubles. I found one that was really great, I set it aside. At the end, there were three that I had cho chosen. Um, I left and walked outside and took a break and got the sound of traffic in my ears and sort of cleansed everything and went back upstairs and I played those three instruments. One jumped out immediately. That's what I brought and, and uh, brought, brought it home. The basses, I never worry about. We can always fix them, but you can't always fix the troubles. You want to make sure that those are working very well. I should explain. Um, I got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, difference between hard tension, medium 
tension strings? Uh, what would you prefer? Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, the, the question is, uh, strain manufacturers make basically three grades of tension, light, medium, and high, or if it's Satyrus or, or Augustine or whatever, hard tension, whatever. But basically high, medium, low, what's the difference? Uh, I like the highest tension string I can get, and I want it as high off the fingerboard as possible. I want to be able to manipulate it a lot to get a note that I want. Um, that doesn't work for everybody. That's like really taut telephone lines on your instrument. Hurts the fingers. It's hard to make them go if you haven't been playing a lot. So a medium tension or a light tension string uh, can be preferred for players who don't play a lot, uh, meaning every day for three or four hours. Um, the penalty when you get to a lighter gauge string is it's more susceptible to um, have extraneous sounds when you're playing. So if we have that note and we like it and we go to a different string, can you hear the little very often, uh, a string of lesser tension will not sit exactly on the fret without making a little ancillary noise at the same time. But I like them. I like them high, and I like them really, really tight. Yeah, I, the medium seem to be more mellow. The intent to me. I, I yeah. Do you play a classical guitar? Not yeah. string? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Well, as always, I, I, I bounce between the two. <laughs> you do between high tension and the. Tension. All right, we'll keep doing that because it's a it's a good keeps you on your toes. Um, you know, the key is to keep mixing it up. Also, it depends on the instrument that you use. Some, some, okay. Um, the kind of instrument you're playing and the action, the way it's set up will have some bearing on, on the kind of string that's preferred. Yeah. Um, do you use a footstool? Yes. That or anything else that's handy. <laughs> yeah. The guitar case. Usually the case. <laughs> footstool. Everybody has one of these at home, right? Folds up. Now it's a dessert topic. <laughs> so the classical guitar is played in this position. The objective is to get the neck up uh, so that we, we don't have to deal with gravity out here. And also to make it easier to play up high. That cane that Segovia had when he went first went to the Ramirez shop, he wound up using later in his life because he had lower back problems. Um, I too develop lower back problems. Uh, the older I got and the longer I played. And that is a result of having your leg in this elevated position for hours on end and not challenging whether or not there's a better way to do it. There's naturally never a right or wrong, but if you start having back pain, then something isn't right. And I found this device that collapses just like the footstool does. But it's got a little flap and a piece of fabric here. And when fitted with suction cups to the side of the instrument, it doesn't doesn't hurt the finish of the instrument at all. This comes out, you set it down, you've got both feet flat on the floor now. But we've still got this profile. Now, maybe it takes uh, a little time to learn how to use it. 
And it took me about a day. So that's good. This is uh, called a guitar support. Just generically, that's the category. There's lots of them. There are some that look like an erector set that bring the instrument way up, and there's all kinds of lines running around. And, and they look horrid, actually. But uh, we really do have to go. I'm sorry, were there any other questions? It's a great question. This is a relatively new development. Um, the difference between the carbon string and the nylon string uh, is the nylon string has got a little uh, compliance to it. It moves with your finger. It's almost like a tire you can push in on it. Carbon string, I do not find, has that compliance. It's a very, very hard surface. And uh, the first set I, uh, I used, I had an excessive amount of nail wear. Um, for those who aren't aware, we, we grow the end of the nail off the end of the finger. We use the nail to play the string, like a lever. Well, with the carbon string, when I would sit down and play two, three, four hours, and just come to just, it would just tear the nail off. I wouldn't have anything. You know, tomorrow I couldn't do the same thing because I didn't have any nail. So I'd have to wait, you know, a week, you know, for the nail to renew and come out and then reshape it, you know, file and all that. So, yeah. Do you use the carbon? I used them a while back. They're a little bit more expensive. I like the trouble that I got off that. Like I said, very, very clear. Very, very That's true. Presence. Yeah, there's certainly a sound difference. There's no doubt about that. So what about heading out on stage and you break a nail? <laughs> I'm always looking for advice there. out of a house in Seattle in winter to get in a car uh, and be driven uh, to the concert venue to play a program. I put my hand out to open the back door of the car and snapped off two nails. Been there, done that. So, three and a half hours. Uh, my host took me to a a nail salon, is that what you call it? Yeah, where they do all kinds of decorative, you know, the ladies know about. And this, <laughs> this woman uh, just, get, just put on three new nails right over the top, some sort of composite, a powder and a, and a binder, a liquid binder and a UV light and, you know, it was all voodoo to me. Uh, but I asked her to leave enough in there that I could file it, and I filed it just exactly like it was a nail. And it took about 10 minutes, and boom, you know, I went and played the program. That's the answer. What do you do if you're playing and you break a nail? Yo. <laughs> Drinking comes to mind. <laughs> uh, you know, will the check clear? I've never been there. 
is now, of course, <laughs> you know, you modify your behavior to accommodate your profession. And there was a time when I wouldn't even take out the trash, you know, because I don't want to break a nail, you know, or wash the dishes or, yeah. Well, those days are over. I've been waiting for it to settle in, and it did. This is uh, an arrangement of uh, Leo Brower's famous Versus. Uh, this setting was given to me by Mario Abril, a Cuban guitarist who was put in jail in Cuba and there shared a cell with another guitarist who gave him this arrangement of the same tune. Uh, it's different. If you know the music, it's different. Uh, but it's still the same material content. It's called Afro-Cuban Lullaby. <laughs> winds up uh, my part of the program. Uh, repeating, I am the latest member of the teaching faculty at Wickham Road Music and delighted uh, to be that. And if you have an interest in classic style guitar playing, I wish you'd come by the store and we could talk some more. Uh, and of course, I'm always available for lessons with the the first visit is free. Thank you for your attention. Hope you all have a wonderful day, and please hang around for more uh, that's coming. Thank you, Don. Right.